Well, first I'd like to thank our hosts, Carl and Content, with a song. Uh, sorry, I'm not going to sing. I'm just referring to Frank Sinatra. A beautiful song, long... <laughs> He's very surprised. <laughs> Uh, a song that says, long ago, and far, long ago and far away. So thank you for bringing us all here from so far away to discuss uh, long ago uh, matters that still matter. And it's been an excellent opportunity. I'm sure it's uh, already quite evident for us to come together uh, to exchange our uh, you know, thoughts and our ideas in a very direct manner. I'm really, really grateful for this. Uh, we may not have uh, answers for everything, of course, who would? But uh, the point is that we come up with new ways of asking the same old questions. So I'm going to ask the same old question, what is a palace, uh, palace and town, and things like that, and hopefully with a little bit of a new uh, approach. At least it's uh, new for me, I must say. So what do I do here? This, okay. So before I get there, however, I'd like to make a very uh, brief can I look at that? Okay. A very brief um, comment on architecture in the context of archaeology. So, first of all, I should say that the product of a work of architecture is a dynamic process. So it's certainly an inherent quality, this uh, dynamic uh, nature. So it uh, involves uh, it's a, a polyparametric problem-solving uh, process which means uh, taking into account many parameters uh, which quite often conflict with each other. So when it comes to making decisions and um, making choices, then there's a lot of compromise that has to be done and optimization. Uh, needless to point out, of course, this is a process that never ends. I mean, e even after the, the, the product is initially uh, constructed, through the various life cycles of the building, you have a repetition of this cycle. Even if you are just going to uh, block an existing door, you have to go through the same kind of polyparametric problem solving. So things are quite uh, difficult, and uh, this is quite um, evident, this difficulty of describing, of grasping the, the process of uh, architectural design. Uh, Rowe gives a very, uh, <laughs> An eloquent a description of why architectural design problems are wicked problems, but it's also evident in the many, many uh, efforts to, to produce theories of design procedure. You see a few over there, none of which is uh, absolutely effective. So we do have a problem there. So with all this introduction, I mean, things look very gloomy. But, uh, so what is it when we come to archaeology? Because these cycles of uh, living cycles of the building, they end either when the building exists no more, for whatever reason, or when it becomes an object of archaeological investigation. So what is the case when the archaeologist comes in? Well, what the archaeologist is actually doing is starting from st static data, unavoidably, the ruins, what you have at hand, and trying to reverse the process and go back to this uh, initial situation where you have the, the conception of the building, where you have all these parameters, which parameters are telling of the way of life that they were, the building was supposed to serve. So that's what we are uh, after. So how do we get there? Well, thanks to what Echo says here, that architecture is not the field of creative freedom some might imagine it to be, unless we're talking of uh, today uh, star uh, system uh, architecture, of course. Huh? So it's a system of rules for giving society what it expects in the way of architecture. I find this description very uh, effective because it explains the whole uh, cycle that you can see in this uh, drawing, the architect as the agent, uh, society and the commission are all in one uh, trying to uh, understand each other and this in pre-industrial uh, societies uh, is uh, facilitated by the fact that we are using, um, I mean tradition is all about standardization and models and variations and uh, things that have uh, shown how they work so you just repeat them. So this is what is of great help to us from the point of view of uh, the uh, archaeologist, archaeological investigation because what we are trying to find is this system of rules. Now, 
For this, we need theoretical tools. And where do we find them? Well, broadly speaking, there are two uh, pools, two different um, ways of uh, thinking, two ways of thought. One is the uh, analytical, the social sciences, the uh, computer, computer kind of analysis. And the other is, broadly speaking, again, a phenomenological point of view. Well, the rift between the two has taken serious dimensions at time. But as far as I understand, today, a lot of voices speak in favor of bridging this rift. And actually, Helio himself is in favor of such an approach. And his, in his um, article, Between Social Physics and Phenomenology, he explores precisely the way that uh, you can have an urban synthesis by taking the view from the bridge, as he explains, where you can see both sides equally. Well, this is something that I find quite a um, logical thing to do. I embrace this kind of situation. And uh, he says that the theory of the city depends on the view from the bridge from which both sides can be seen with the comparable clarity. And at that point, I realized that I've been walking on one side of the <laughs> the, the rift of uh, you know, one bank, which is basically phenomenological uh, point of view. Not that I really knew that it was phenomenology, what I did when I started uh, you know, writing about my known architecture, but it seems it to be. And so I decided to cross the bridge and go over to the other side and see what I can get there. And as um, you told us yesterday, that you can always get you know, some ideas by looking at other theories, other theoretical tools. And uh, to my surprise, uh, why should it be a surprise, I don't know, I found quite a lot of things that I could bring back home for me, because home is the other side, and <laughs> that, well, yeah. <laughs> and they, they helped me very, very much to uh, think in uh, a different way uh, as before. So one of the things, uh, however, that I realized is that both sides are very focused on the concept of the part and the whole in different ways, but they're very much concerned in how we uh, perceive the part and, and how do we perceive the whole uh, in each case. Uh, Hillier again says that although we experience cities a bit at a time, our sense of the city does not reflect this fragmentation, indeed. On the contrary, our sense of a city is made up of a sense of its differentiated parts and transitions between them. This I understand pretty well. What I'm not sure I understand is how do we come up with this sense of, uh, I mean, that there's something there missing. By the way, differentiation of parts and transitions between them are two key words in what I will try to uh, present here. So looking around for help, I came up with this uh, article by Reed and Gill. Uh, again from the analytical side of the bridge, which I found very interesting. So what they do in this article is they, they talk about two different ways of understanding the specialization of cities and neighborhoods. One is a diagram of nested areas that needs to be supplemented by a diagram of overlay grids. Now what they are referring to is uh, the two uh, diagrams you can see here. The first, the aerial definition, is a familiar way of mapping differentiated parts grouped according to relevance. And transitions, of course, in this case, are to be sought at the boundaries of these uh, circles. Now, the second one, the network definition, or grids laid over grids, is an entirely different approach to differentiation and transition. The grid system consists of several layers of grids, of streets, one on top of the other, ranging from the lower level of local streets to the intermediate level of the neighborhood, and finally to the supergrid. This is the key word they are using here. Supergrid, which consists of the major arteries that carry heavy traffic and have a more public role. The way I understood this is that parts of this street grid, grid belong to all three levels simultaneously. So our understanding of differentiation and transition is based on context. And to make this a bit more clear, actually what they are saying here is that it's a different way of understanding being inside or being and outside. In the area definition of inside and outside, things are pretty clear. 
So you have the transitions at the boundaries and spaces divided into insides and outsides quite clearly. In the network definition of inside and outside, a structure of insideness may be understood in relation to the logic or sense internalized as contexts in the uh, network. So things outside the network will not join in this sense-making logic, although, of course, they may make sense in an entirely different network. I'm not sure if this is clear. I mean, it took me some time to <laughs> clarify it in my mind, but the next uh, phrase is pretty clear. I mean, the, the way we experience the city is delivered by the supergrid, basically, while the experience of being in the neighborhood is delivered by the regular uh, grid. And this is verticality, the various levels. This verticality, rather, is scale as we understand and live it in our everyday lives. Well, uh, looking more carefully into the difference between the two uh, diagrams, uh, I'll see that there is, I mean, they also say that, there is a socio-spatial correlation. In the bounded areas, for example, what you have is a correspondence to segregated communities. And the case of O, which has been already presented, is, I think, quite uh, a good example. <coughs> it's, I mean, the, 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 the circles and all this bounding uh, situation is very, very clear. Uh, the part of the town that corresponds to the town fabric itself is the product of an infield development. I mean, you don't see any grids over there. There's no through traffic. It's actually just two movement. And you see that it's a very dense kind of uh, fabric with no public spaces, no uh, gatherings. Public spaces and gatherings are only under the auspices of the uh, temple in an entirely different uh, circle. So this is a typical case of a bounded area uh, and a segregated community. And by the way, the, the house, the typical house of Ur, is of the same logic. It's of the same logic, I mean, uh, bounded areas, because the courthouse is uh, of that uh, type, basically. Okay? The other type now, which is the um, super grid, is what I think that my known uh, towns are all about. I mean, in my known uh, towns, we do not have the uh, bounded areas uh, model. We have the grid model, and I think that the super grid can be applied uh, in this uh, case as well. And uh, Kanten, you did present, I think, some ideas of Calegastro and working with um, the dynamics of the, the street pattern and so on. Uh, this is absolutely <coughs> indicative. I mean, I'm not saying that these are exactly the, the purple is the super grid and the red is the lower level. But I believe that even though our data is not complete, it would be very useful if we actually can map this uh, situation and then try and see the intersections. Because according to space index, as I understand, it's at the intersections that things happen. <coughs> That's where we have attraction points. That's where we may understand the dynamics of uh, the town. So this corresponds to integrated communities, and I believe that this is the case of the uh, Minoan towns. And again, the uh, typical house uh, logic of uh, Minoan uh, architecture is of that um, idea. I cannot now elaborate very much on this because that would take me far away. But, uh, and also the fact that the, grid, the notion of the grid exists in neo-palatial architecture very much, but that's a far-fetched comparison. I don't mean that because we have uh, grids in architecture you have in town plan as well, but it's a kind of a familiarity in the concept. So uh, we can you know, check most of the uh, cities that we have, the, town, the minor towns that we have enough information with this kind of logic. A criteria which I know better, I think it can work pretty well, although it's uh, always very frustrating that you don't know exactly where these uh, streets uh, lead and what happens you know, a few meters uh, further away. But nevertheless, I believe that uh, one can pinpoint this kind of grid and then start thinking about what happens at the intersections. Uh, a criteria is quite different from my known house in that there much, there's much more open public space than there is in my known, uh, most my known uh, towns, at least. And these open public spaces are at the intersection of such streets and things like that. I'm just describing ideas now and ways that one <coughs> can proceed with uh, interpretive models. Now, uh, on the other hand, it's not that difficult to pinpoint the supergrid because the minors themselves 
had, I mean, at least I believe so, uh, they had done that themselves, I mean. They, they sort of um, promote the idea of a super grid with this uh, means. <coughs> First of all, with uh, an axiality, you have long and wide streets. I should emphasize uh, the word wide because the whole concept of the, the supergrid has to do with the transportation system, with the means of transportation. So you, have, you need a specific width uh, for the supergrid. So axiality is one way. Ashler facades, as with Palekastro, uh, and a criteria as well. It's not exclusive. It's not that, uh, you know, where you have Ashler facades, you have the supergrid there. But the other way, I think, works better. I mean, that most supergrid streets will have Ashler facades. Then it's the indentation of the facades and the raised uh, walkways that I will refer to uh, right away. So the indentation, which is a very well-known tool of urban design in Minoan uh, architecture. Uh, first of all, the indentations are shallow and very rhythmical. Uh, they occur uh, every two or three meters. So they are easy to to perceive as you walk along the street. Uh, next thing we should emphasize is that this indentation goes along different properties. It would you know, continue from one property, one house to the other, in a way that when you are outside, you cannot please easily perhaps uh, distinguish between the different uh, buildings. Uh, you can see that even the town mosaic down there, which I think that it sort of expresses a main street facade or a super grid facade, or, because we are always talking about the same thing. Uh, they went into the trouble of um, using many different ways of having this undulation at the end. You have the different thickness, some of the plaques are truly indented, and so on. So if you put them on a flat surface, you would have this undulating effect. So finally, what I understand is that this tool of urban design <coughs> indentation is a tool for unifying. It's a unifi um, uh, unifying element. And unification means, first of all, that the uh, verticality of the building, because we are talking of two and three story buildings, if you see them separately, then you have a strong vertical effect. But if you add them into a long uh, facade, street facade, then you have horizontality prevailing. And horizontality is a, a key word in my known architecture in general. Um, so in a way, the individuality of uh, the house in many different ways, in formal ways, in context, I guess, well, things like that, is subdued to the public image. So to my understanding, for an outsider walking through Emanuel town and using the supergrid, because that's what an outsider would use, this is the kind of uh, effect that the Emanuel wanted him or her to carry with them you know, when they go away. This is the, the image of uh, the city. I would dare say, perhaps, that it's a kind of an egalitarian approach, the way that uh, you subdue this individuality into something that is a public uh, image. So this is the function of the uh, indentation in the horizontal. But we shouldn't forget that there is an indentation on the vertical as well. We miss it in our excavation uh, reports, of course, because it's not there. Uh, even Akrotiri does not afford the skyline uh, as such. We have, however, images from uh, art you see to the right there, which give an idea of uh, the undulation of uh, the skyline, which is of a similar type. The way you have this outline, again, does not allow for one building to dis uh, distinguish uh, in comparison to the other. And we, because we, we, know, we are all already have the palace in mind, the palace fits very much this uh, idea. And by the way, where we have forms of consecration, judging from art, of course, because we do not have such evidence uh, uh, archaeologically, Again, I feel that the idea of verticality, because one uh, pair of forms of concentration is with its symmetry and its elongated forms, has a very strong vertical effect. But again, a row of such things uh, becomes a horizontal element. Just like a column is a vertical element, but a colonnade is a horizontal uh, result, of course. Eh? So this is the function of uh, the indentation, both in the horizontal and the vertical. And here, I dare do something else. Again, reading Hillier and, and uh, space syntax. Uh, in an article in 1999, which has uh, the title, <coughs> The Hidden Geometry of Deformed Grids, Hillier, or why space syntax works when it looks as though it shouldn't. 
just the title, you know, made me curious, so I read it carefully, and I understand that he is kind of responding to a kind of critic about, you're talking about grids, grids, but all we have is deformation things. And I, I, I was persuaded, persuaded, more or less, you know, with his logic, which I cannot explain now here, of course, why, uh, in his un uh, understanding, uh, there is an underlying notion of a clear grid. And we come to this indentation here, you see to the right how the indentation goes. I mean, the, uh, the, the, the bodily, the, the corporeal, where is it, kind of experience, would be going from here to there in that direction. I could have done it like that, that, that direction. But the facades, because they look there, they sort of guide you mentally elsewhere. And then if you draw the picture, you zoom out, you are here, you see that your body moves in that direction, but the facade sort of prepare you for this direction, which you will find again after this kind of deviation, which has to do with the contours of the land and things like that. So I'm not sure if uh, Hillier would agree with me, but it, you know, it may be a kind of unconscious way of um, helping with direction rather than orientation. Because when I first wrote about the indentations, I have this plan here, and the idea was that it's a way to adjust rectangular architecture with a fixed orientation north-south onto a route which is arbitrary, not arbitrary, but it has resulted from the contours of the lab. So how do you fit this here? Very much the way the computer jumps around to do a, a curved line. That would be for orientation, that would be for direction. Raised walkways are very well known, so I really don't think that I have much more to add. We all have discussed them one way or the other. Uh, Jan has talked about uh, the threads of Ariadne and the, the red carpet and all that, which is perfect. Uh, they have a very strong presence, however, and there's such an innovative uh, uh, element of, my, uh, of architecture, not just my known, in the history of architecture. To tell you the truth, there are things in my known architecture that drive me crazy. In, in the sense that I've you know, been studying history of architecture, I've been involved in modern architectural practice, and there is a dynamic there that you don't find it before and after. But okay, we'll talk about that if you like. So you have this strong presence of uh, axiality, of uh, geometry, clear geometry. You have color effects, which are very important. Uh, very strong, actually, effects. You have white, uh, dark or light colors, we have, you have this um, differentiation, which helps very much, by the way, when it's dark outside and you have no electricity to guide you around. I think in my day it's very clear. Right? Yes. And that's, by the way, also the, why, uh, the whitewash in vernacular architecture, the whitewashed tops of uh, fences built of stone. So at night you're walking the path and you can follow the path. So, uh, we know a lot about raised walkways. Just a, a small um, comment about these transverse uh, diagonals, which are very, very impressive. Uh, well, first of all, I understand them as uh, shortcuts. Uh, who was it that showed? I'm sorry, I can't remember now. Who? Tim showed. Tim showed your very first picture? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Actually, I, had an, I have another one, not here, where it's one of these American cities after a snowfall, where you don't see the street pattern at all, and then you have just transversal uh, you know, paths that go from one point of interest to the other, which is plain logic, and it's the least effort uh, effect. But there's something a little, uh, by the way, I found out they're called desire lines, elephant paths, do you know this kind of terminology? Well. Forget it, you may be wrong. It's Wikipedia after all. <laughs> <laughs> Elephant parts, I like that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and there is an explanation why, but well, elephants wouldn't really care about what you have designed. Uh, they would go their, their own way. But one other thing I, I, I wish to emphasize is that the diagonal is an event in a Cartesian system of architecture, which is the Minoan architecture. It's an event, if not a scandal, <laughs> to have such a strong. Uh, diagonal crossing. Actually, in modern architecture, we offer, we often uh, suggest our students, you know, that make it more um, powerful. Why don't you, uh, we use this silly word, make a good gesture like that. And it's always diagonal we show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but the other thing is that 
a diagonal exists only in relation to a Cartesian grid. So, in effect, what it does, this diagonal, is it enhances the presence of the Cartesian uh, system. Now, as to, before I go there, as to what they are meant for, and it, and it has only been, already been uh, discussed, I mean, they are for mundane uh, use as well, and for formal use as well, of course. It's a, a matter of time and a matter of context. We come back to this verticality of layers. In an everyday life, you would use them one way, and some formal actions you would use them differently. In which case, if you want to study the, this pattern of uh, Walkways, you have to study them in two separate contexts and see how they fit and where they join and all that. So this is raised postways, and finally we go to the Minoan Palace. All right, the Minoan Palace is notoriously difficult to describe, to define, to have a typology and all that. It's very resistant to typology, especially. So one way to approach, even if all we are asking is, where does it start in terms of design object? What is it? We're not asking much. Nevertheless, it's difficult to uh, describe it. One way is you know, going uh, the opposite way by what it is not. So uh, the Manon Palace is not a building. I absolutely insist on that, and I'll give you some more uh, <coughs> examples why and arguments. And, and neither is part of the town in the sense it's not a fragment of the homogeneous uh, fabric of the town. So what is it? And by the way, we should just make sure that what do we mean by a building? So a building is, um, buildings are arrangements of boundaries that demarcate interior space according to the organization of human life and activity. And the building is usually a continuously connected interior. So even uh, according to this kind of definition, uh, the palace does not fit well, okay? So again, as a design object, what is it? I would say that it is a constituent part of the town. Okay, thank you, we know that, of course or incorporated organically, not embedded, in a wider geographical concentration. I insist on the word incorporated and not embedded. A building can be embedded. Uh, a palace in uh, Near Eastern uh, societies is embedded. But the Minoan Hall is incorporated. And this incorporation is uh, possible because it is, from the point of view of architectural design, the result of an urban, what I call an urban group, formation I have to explain in a moment, okay? Which is the adaptation and adaptation of attributes of town plan. So now it's time to, ah, no, the next one. No, this one, levels of uh, design, of spatial organization. I'm trying to explain now what do I mean by urban or group design. And I'm referring here to the multi-scholar nature of the built uh, environment. In terms of uh, design, it involves Textural design, which applies to the building and its immediate environment. Urban design, forget the group for the moment, which refers to a number of interrelated buildings and all the open air spaces, private and public, that relate to their function. Then you have town planning, which deals with public space and land use at the level of a settlement, whatever it is. And then you have regional planning, which encompasses uh, economic and social issues besides architecture. Usually, we sort of skip this uh, in between, this urban uh, scale. We go straight to town planning. And this is, I did, didn't know how to handle the situation, so I call it mesoscale one and mesoscale two, because the two are very closely related. But it is a distinct level of architectural design. In modern terms, I would say that designing a university campus, uh, the waterfront way of a, a city, these would be uh, urban uh, design um, project. Of course, we often use the word urban as um, similar as the same with town planning, but it's not exactly. In, in Greek, it's even more clear, as the poleodomikos. Of course, all levels are interrelated uh, in a social uh, spatial network. So this is how I understand urban design. Uh, I'm not sure if, it, if it's clear, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to elaborate a bit more. Now, the term group design is uh, a term first used by uh, Robert Stranton uh, to describe the correlation between sacred freestanding buildings within a terminus or an agora. That was the initial idea. <coughs> then Gideon took over the term and he defined group design as a spatial harmony 
between several independent buildings, each of which has its own formal individuality. That's how he explains it. And harmony is the result of the way things come together, volumes in this case, which means that it's all about their interface and their articulation, as experienced through circulation and movement. Scranton and, and Gideon, and they all put a lot of emphasis, and Oxiadis, of course, on, on the manipulation of movement. Because although you do not have paths specifically designed, the way that the buildings stand around and what they leave in between for you to walk around, it's sort of, uh, without you completely understanding it, you know, it sort of guides you how to appreciate the volumes, with perspective or frontal or uh, whatever. So I believe that this is a very uh, strong um, tool again of uh, spatial organization. So I think that this idea fits pretty well uh, the design concept of a Minoan palace. So again, if we describe urban or group design, first of all, as an integral part of the town plan, the two go together. And in a while you see that I will have town, dot, uh, uh, town and uh, palace as one entity. So we need individual buildings, contextually related, spatially organized through circulation control. And here what we have at Knossos, if you take out one, two, three, just you know, as an example, these units, which I think of them as, as individual buildings in a way, buildings with more specific facades, but buildings nevertheless, you can see them better if you put them down like that, uh, how, how very, very different they are. Uh, actually, they enrich very much our knowledge of the typology of uh, my known architecture. We sort of, usually we see them all together as one, but if you take them out, then you see the strong individuality of each one, and distinct architectural character. Storage, standard, repetitive, elevated, administrative, small, dark, intricate, uh, domestic, fluid, flexible, mutable. You can describe them literally in, in terms of the distinct uh, character. Now, as to the uh, spatially organized uh, circulation control, well, this gray area is all about circulation and in most cases, not everywhere, but in most cases, these different building units, let's think of them like that, they do not abut, they do not come together. What they have in between is what we understand and recognize as a street uh, logic in the, in, uh, in, in the form of uh, long corridors, of course. Eh? So you have all this uh, pattern of uh, movement. And here uh, comes mistake number one, Tim, for you, uh, because you know, uh, I've always thought there are two things in my own architecture, at least, uh, that I, I think to myself that if a modern studio of architecture would draw it like that, we would say, hmm, covers it, was the Not good. So uh, what I'm referring to is that you have an extreme amount of area which is dedicated to circulation and movement. I didn't have uh, the, the time to calculate, but in another instance, it's like almost 40% or the total area is given over to circulation. And what are these people doing? They're just moving around, you know, moving and moving. And if you look more carefully in certain areas like this one, for example, or even this one, um, they, with all these doors which create a kind of pattern of uh, circulation, what is left over for pause and not movement is little. Well, anyway. So there's a very strong presence of a network of uh, circulation in uh, the Maynard Palace, which is the constituent part of its uh, logic. Uh, it becomes even more interesting because uh, this is unique to uh, Maynard architecture. Uh, I'd, I'd like Hilliard to know this, you know, because it's very special. The Maynards go one step further and they, they sort of extend this circulatory pattern, this grid, into the second and third floor as well. And they do this by adding staircases along these uh, rooms. But just to make clear, you know, in a multi-story architecture, as is the minor architecture, of course, you have a lot of staircases. But a lot of staircases, you have a lot, a lot of staircases here. This, uh, for example, look at the domestic quarters. In such a small place, you have one, two, three staircases. And in this case, if you take the uh, circulation out, What's left in terms of interior uh, use, I mean, it's really little. So it can't be a mistake, of course. I mean, this was conscious and this was deliberate on their part. 
it, but our feeling towards this situation is a, a bit strange. Now, the, the, the staircases, uh, one could group them in two categories. There are staircases which are found in the core of the building unit, like these here, for example, which indicate that uh, the, the, the building, the zone, cluster, the same thing, the building extends in the vertical as well. Or there are staircases which are at the periphery of this building and unit, in which case they belong to the supergrid. Here, for example, this, the grand staircase, belongs to the supergrid, as this corridor also belongs to the supergrid. Whereas these are the interior showing that we have a multi-story extension here. So, all in all, I would say that the town and palace is an integral design project. I can only think of the, these two designed uh, together, honestly. I mean, I cannot think of sitting down and saying, okay, I'm going to design the palace without the town. This is impossible. It's founded on a potent urban supergrid uh, system, which pre exists, and the overlay of a system of bounded areas is what produces a nested hierarchical uh, structure, as I understand it. Now, this overlay of bounded uh, areas is what is interesting in terms of the intersection between bounded area and supergrid, which means that, okay, now before we go there, there's something else I read which I found very interesting, which I have here. Um, uh, and it's uh, an article by Peponis, who is, again, of course, an analytical school, and Peponis is very much interested in large buildings and large uh, projects, so that fits well the Minoan Palace, and he talks about purview spaces. Uh, and I think that the grid I'm referring to in Minoan Palace works in that way uh, as well. So what he says is that corridors, staircases, and courtyards uh, act as references, for they have properties that are associated with cognitive and organizational performance. One of which is that they provide an expansive visual field and an overview of the connections to adjoining spaces. This we can all understand pretty well. So this is what Peponis describes as having purview over space, which means to be able to judge space as a potential field of access, movement, encounter, and a co-presence. Now, Peponis goes on to use uh, computational analysis to show that purview spaces play a very important role in the design of large complexes, like huge uh, hospitals and, and things like that. And then he says that as buildings get larger, this is interesting, they also get more complex, of course, as indicated by the increasing number of turns between uh, any two locations. But this complexity, he uh, suggests, is kept in check by two mechanisms. One is the increase in the maximum direct purview, which implies the principle of focality, and the emergence of even more powerful vantage points. This I understand as ports. This is better exemplified here at um, Festos, where you have more uh, such vantage points. And the second is the increase in distance per turn, which implies the principle of linearity, the, uh, and the creation of linear, uh, linearity, sorry, of, on the creation of linearly extended direct purviews. In other words, uh, the, the very elongated corridors act in this direction. And I understand that very long uh, corridors, there has to be um, an end to that, because at, at, at beyond a certain length, it starts uh, working the other way around. Um, so the idea is that by uh, positioning strategically, strategically all these uh, purview uh, spaces, okay, no. uh, a subject moving in a building and intuitively comparing locations for the direct purview they afford might be able to remember the particular locations that offer greater overview and link other locations to them. Overview areas, in other words, can act as a skeleton for a cognitive map. Actually, I, I realized after that that this is the way I studied my non architecture and I tried to remember the plan of the palaces by using exactly the same uh, points of reference. All right, so that was Peponis. Uh, and now we go on. Access and entry. Now, I think that this is the most powerful evidence that my non palace is not a building. 
access and entry points to the palace are not true entrances, entrances as we thought of them, think of them uh, in a building, but points of intersection between supergrid and aerial uh, boundaries. First of all, we have uh, many, we have several points of entry in various modes of transition and uh, degrees of formality, which means that for the minors, there was not a very clear uh, model, a clear idea of what to expect in terms of an entrance to a uh, Minoan uh, palace. I mean, if you put down all the entrances of the Minoan palace we have, you see that they are ad hoc. Almost all of them have their own kind of character. Um, and this is also the reason why you have such a variety of names in, in the literature. They call them gates, propylon, this, that. They sort of describe them in a different way each uh, scholar. One thinks that this is a major entrance, the other, the other is, thinks it's not. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that precisely because we have this situation of various buildings coming together, that these entrances, the various entrances, they sort of guide you to the corresponding uh, building unit. So it's not one uh, direction, but it's uh, dispersed all around. Uh, now, the supergrid guides the way, that's meaning that for the major entrances, because there are, there is a hierarchy there, there are a few major entrances, those you can uh, understand and you, they, I mean, the, the urban design helps you and guides you there by what we very well know, the causeways <coughs> that continue all the way into uh, the uh, buildings. This is an, an amazing effect in itself, the fact that you have this uh, the street pattern sort of invading uh, the palace. Uh, and just to give an example here of the west porch of uh, the uh, Palace of Knossos, which would be mistake number two. Uh, if you stop and think of the Minoan <coughs> Palace, all of it, where is its entrance? It's, it's sort of located in, in a corner, it's tackled in a corner. You don't have good um, access or visibility. I mean, it's pretty wrong, at least in modern terms, to walk along a facade and the entrance is going to be along this facade. Because you will see it only when you get close. It's not really a good idea. In that sense, it's a mistake. And to be honest, I mean, if there were not, if, if, if it wasn't for the raised walkways, you would really be at a loss of where this uh, entrance uh, is. So the way I see this uh, formulation here is uh, with all the indentation of uh, the facade of uh, the palace uh, helping as well, it's like, like, how do I say this here? A powerful magnet that sort of sucks movement uh, inside. So <coughs> you have this feeling that you have a very powerful kind of um, movement and direction. By the way, I must say that every entrance is also an exit, and in that sense, I'm not so sure how this works. I understand it going in, but I'm not so sure I understand it going out. Uh, also, at the, this is the point of intersection between aerial borders and the supergrid. So at this point, you have a brief pause to check and to be checked, obviously. Uh, but also, you have to decide where you're going and what's happening. And all this information, despite the fact that it's not the same uh, phase, uh, there was a time that <coughs> this is exactly what you would experience over there. So there's a conjecture. There's a lot of information, too much information to absorb and understand. So that would be, in a way, a kind of a mistake to our eyes, of course. Eh? Whereas if you <coughs> look at other cases of uh, architecture, <coughs> the, the palaces are uh, buildings, uh, as we define them. Entrances are very um, elaborate and very enhanced in many ways. Approach system is very important. This is important. The fact that this entrance here is flat and even between exterior and interior, between public and semi-public, whatever it is, again is a different feeling from moving up. Usually moving up is more you know, effective in terms of um, crystals. Festos is coming here. <laughs> and I think Festos is an excellent uh, example, thank you, yeah, uh, of the intersection between supergrid and aerial boundaries, both in the horizontal and the vertical. There we go again. I mean, think the minors really went beyond themselves in understanding the three dimensions of space. 
And uh, what we have here is, is not an entrance. I mean, it has been described by so many people, so I don't have to say more. But red is staircases, and this is uh, not an entrance as we would understand. It's, it's the same like what we saw before. It's a pause to understand where you want to go, and, the, and this is the point where you have the grid coming into uh, the boundary of the palace. And this coming into gives you the opportunity to continue at one level or disappear on the upper level as well, which means that the grid continues on the upper level. All right, central court. This is the destination uh, and origin at the same time. This is arrest and movement, point zero of the town and palace supergrid and factor hotspot uh, according to uh, terminology of uh, Helium. Uh, one thing I should say is that this is the only place where you have formality, where you have clear dimension, proportion, everything, but uh, you have a formality in terms of uh, the, the facades going all around. And this formality, however, allows for the individuality of building components. The building units we, we discussed before, each one projects onto this facade in a different way. You can tell that this is one, this is another, and so on. And at the same time, you have uh, a unity. They, I mean, they, they, they wanted to have a unified uh, effect, which is uh, made possible by a common vocabulary of interlocking elements, which are colonnades, the porticos, and the balconies. So uh, it's no coincidence that this, this is the heart of uh, the Minoan town, and this is where you have all the formality you can get in terms of Minoan architecture. Moreover, I think of the central court as a kind of powerful magnet that attracts and repulses at the same time. And because, I mean, I, sometimes I feel this kind of tension almost palpable when I am at Massos, for example. In there. And to, to make this possible, you need this strict proportion, strict strictness in terms of formality. So it's a kind of magnet that keeps the distance and at the same time attracts, very much like uh, what Robert Schultz uh, describes here as the mankind's desire to concentrate and scatter, uh, scatter to exploit the riches of the earth and concentrate to make interaction and progress possible. So I'm thinking in terms of both uh, tensions, outwards and inwards, that keep this uh, equilibrium. And this is a kind of a effect, a blasting effect, effect that goes out into the city as well. And this effect we understand better at the west facade, here. And you see the effect here. And at this point, I want to raise another question. Where are the palace's facades? When I think of Zadros Palace, for example, I'm really trying to think of it from the outside, and I can't think of any real outside. And this goes for the other palaces to a certain degree. But what is more clear is where you have, of course, uh, west courts. Uh, here, the west facades of the major uh, the palaces, at least, part of the facade has a certain clarity of this sort. You see the same thing, more or less. And it's the effect of the explosion going out. This is pushing the, the town, which sort of subsides and lets uh, uh, some space here in front uh, for uh, public gatherings and all that. Because if you look carefully at all these um, plans, uh, within the urban context, of course, you will see that the west port is broader here. And then on both sides, both the port and the facade, they sort of escalate and they fade away. And this, the, uh, to a certain extent, you can follow the facade, but then you sort of lose it. But the, the town encroaches, so you never really have a full understanding of a facade, which would mean a plane, a plane with... Um, distinct uh, frame, okay? Uh, I'm coming from that now. So one more um, argument for the uh, magnet effect of uh, the central port, which has a cosmic uh, um, underlying here. You have the specific orientation that comes from the void, which is the central port, and this gives you the basic coordinates, but you are missing the third dimension here to complete the picture. And this is something they take over from the peak sanctuary, wherever this is possible. So 
in a way, the, okay, I don't have to say more. <laughs> and I'm just closing with two uh, slides. Uh, I would say that the Mainon um, town is a vital city, an articulate city, very much the way that Jane Jacobson describes, of, with mixed building types, that, and that we know for sure, uh, a mixed land use, we don't know that much, but I'm sure it is, dance, very population, all of that. But the way we see it, I mean, you see this variety, the theme and variation, we'll come back to this kind of uh, understanding here. And this is uh, Len Krier, who describes uh, the ways that a city can be articulate or not articulate. This is the case of the Mainland town, and a good place to be. And finally, again, Len Krier there, you have, I think, a true civic achievement in the sense that you have dispersed land uses, you have this intricate connection between town and uh, authority and monumental architecture and all that. So you have what it takes, this and that, that ends up with a true city.